everybody to another episode of the Industry Leaders Podcast with myself, Kim Leggett, and my partner in crime, Dane McDonald. How are you doing, Dane? I'm good. I've uh, had pr- a pretty busy day today so far, so looking forward to it kind of I don't know if it's going to slow down or ramp up with this episode, but I'm looking forward to getting into it anyway. Yeah, and we've got a really great guest today. Someone I actually didn't do very, I didn't know very much about until I looked into his backstory and I was amazed because it blew me away. This is is Basha, who we're talking to, who is the um, head CEO of EHP Labs, someone that uh, you know yourself personally, Dane, um, but his story really blew me away. He uh, immigrated to Australia um, he was fleeing persecution. He had a corporate job and then dropped that due to burnout and then started this multi-million dollar company. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, uh, is, is, is a bit of a, you know, go hard founder like myself. Um, you know, I've known is for a few years. We actually kind of, um, we met through our, I guess our mutual relationship with Lauren Simpson. So she was an EHP athlete at the time. She was also a clean health athlete at the time. And so we, you know, she was a client of mine um, and, you know, used to coach her and she had a relationship with EHP. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, she, she organized a kind of um, catch up for us one day and we really hit it off. Like, I mean, he, like myself, he grew up in the uh, inner Western suburb of Sydney. So he's, you know, like uh, kind of learnt around the school of hard knocks, but he's a, a really mm-hmm. great guy. He's a really um, quite a humble guy for for everything that he's done. And he's super committed to change. I think, you know, one thing I've always yeah. liked about EHP and their supplements is, you know, their, their, their research base. He puts very um, high quality ingredients into his products. And because he's kind of gone mm-hmm. through some of his own health concerns over the years, um, you know, they're, they're designed from like a wellness standpoint as well. That's so right. their performance blended with wellness, which, you know, obviously as part of our clean health um, education ethos is, is super important. So, um, yeah, look, excited to get you on the show today. And um, I'm sure he's going to have quite an interesting uh, story for us. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm going to get him on right now. Well, welcome is for um, joining myself and Dane on another episode of the Industry Leaders podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, before... Uh, we get into the interview. I just want to give a bit of a spiel about yourself for anyone that doesn't know you. So is you are the man behind EHP Labs, which I think everyone would recognize and know. You have an amazing story, which we want to actually really get into. Uh, But a little spiel about you is you immigrated to Australia. You were bullied as a kid, I've read. Um, You even had um, a autoimmune disease that you were diagnosed with because you were doing 16 hour days, uh, working a corporate job. You put all that aside and you started this multi-million dollar empire, which is now EHP Labs, which is amazing. Um, so other than that, could you just give us a bit of a spiel about your own background and what led you to uh, be where you are today? Yeah, um, uh, we're going to go down a deep rabbit hole here. So let's let's, let's go let's for go it. In. Let's go <laughs> down the hole. Sure where to begin? Yeah, it's from, crazy. From, so, from one from one uh, inner western suburbs boy to another. <laughs> yeah, Parramatta Wildcats, man. We've got that. <laughs> uh, the hood. Um, they raise us tough there. Yeah. So my they family's do. originally from Fiji. You're, you're, you're right, and we migrated here in 1988, escaping political persecution in Fiji. So there was a military wow. coup going on, and my family's got Indo-Fiji and a Fijian Indian heritage. So if you go back far enough, 300 years ago, uh, my dad's side of the family were sugarcane farming slaves taken by the English over to Fiji to work on wow. their indenture system, where they worked essentially for free as sugarcane farmers on the promise that one day you'll get land. Like imagine trying to do that today, man. Hey, come work for free. And I promise <laughs> you. Yeah. Far out. Right. So um, yeah, that's my that's my dad's side of the family. And mum's side of the family tracks back to the Afghan cameleers that came out with the English to explore um, Australia and the Northern Territories. And there's even a huge railway network that's named after them called the GAN. But they then went and settled around the South Pacific and mum's side of the family is, um, so you can see I'm dark, but mum's side of the family is slightly more, yeah, they're lighter skinned. Um, my mum's great grandfather was like seven foot two. Um, so I'm kind of oh, wow. six, six, three and a half. So you can call me shorty. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's, a, that's kind of the history maybe of um, just my lineage. Yeah. It's really important because it does help to define and shape the character and, upbringing um that that i had so born in fiji in suva political persecution the fijian indian race were being targeted by the natives for political reasons uh dad was um 
part of the Ministry of Agriculture um, and um, just, yeah, worked in the government and we were, were targeted. So my family was like, well, let's get the hell out of here. And dad did his um, studies at the University of Queensland um, on a full government scholarship. Dad's from a tiny island where he had no shoes till he was 18. The Australian government had to buy him shoes so he could board the plane. Um, and so he came out to uh, Australia and he's familiar with Australia, amazing country. And he was just, he's raised by an Anglo, like a, an Anglo family in, in Queensland, a white family in Queensland that raised him like their own son. So he loved everything about Australia. We came here and I was this bright, bubbly five-year-old kid with missing front teeth. Um, and as you mentioned, rightly so earlier on, I was um, the victim of just a bit of bullying because I looked different. Um, mm. I wanted to be as Aussie as anything. I refused to eat mum's delicious Fijian curries and all that stuff. And I was a bit of a, yeah, like a, I was, a, I think I was a good kid, but you know, they, they say I was pretty difficult because I just wanted to be something that I, I, I clearly wasn't like, I just wanted to always fit in. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were, we, we moved out to Ashfield uh, initially and things were expensive. My parents, although they had education and stuff, struggled as most immigrant families do to, to get jobs here and do whatever it takes. The whole immigrant dream story of working two jobs each. And, you know, as me and my sister growing up got to, got to see all of that stuff. And as mm -hmm. you can, you can, I always say in life, you can make two choices. You can look at something and resent it, or you can look at something and be inspired about the positives that flow from that. So my very family much. is Fiji and we're very positive. Dane, you've been to Fiji loads of times with your family, right? I love it. I love Fiji. I mean, you know, I think it's it's hearing that, like the, the, the cultural kind of persecution and that, you know, like when you go there as a tourist, especially today or say over the last five years, you could never imagine that because I just, you know, culturally as a people, whether it's uh, Fijians or Fijian Indians, everyone's just bloody happy. You know, um, you know, everyone's like, Bula! and, and, you know, like it's, um, I, I love Fiji. I mean, it's, it's, you know, prior to all this COVID stuff, like, um, you know, we, we were there every Christmas and or every new year's for about the last three, four years straight. Um, and, and, so I'm, and, I'm missing it as I'm, and I'm sure you are even more. And, and, and you're hundred percent right there, man. When you, when you talked about the people of Fiji, we, we lead quite an integrated except like life, everyone, like the native mm. Fijians make better roti and bean curry than the Indians do, you know? So, um, it's, yeah. You know, and there's quite a lot of, uh, you know, marriages between cultures and stuff. You know, my, my cousins are like part Chinese, part Fiji and like native. And I think it, it's very like the, the biggest thing is, you know, and you know, obviously with kids, like it's just so kid friendly. Man, it's as well. It, it's, it's this beautiful community where it's just everyone loves each other just because we're human. Like just, just because mm. we everyone's different and everyone's, you know, people. And I think that, that positive attribute, like I was talking about earlier, you can have two perspectives in life. You can look at something, resent it, or you can look at something and be inspired by the positives that flow out from that. We yep. had that, we had that intrinsically just maybe based on the, 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 maybe the history, the culture, the background, just how we look at things. Like I think the, 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 the culture in particular there, because I think one thing that, you know, I've always taken from being there is just, the concept of gratitude is something that runs inherently through that society, um, you know, because you will, you will see the little kids there playing in the dirt out the front of the shack and they seem a lot happier than a lot of Western kids that are going there on holidays, you know, with their multimillionaire parents. Yeah, it's, um, it definitely is a bit of a reality check and, and you yeah. know, that, that piece of awareness, you know, for your children, uh, Dane, and my, my children, my girls, four and a half, she's been to Fiji like nine times already. And had it not been for, for COVID, we would have been spending uh, quite a lot of last year um, there in Fiji. But um, going back to the story of my sister and I watching, seeing my parents mm. work, there's the other side of the coin of just who, who, who raised you? Like, you know, you, I was five. My sister was nine. My parents were working two jobs each and we barely saw them ever. And so my sister played a pivotal role in that. She was nine. Um, I was five. She used to set little chores for me to vacuum and clean the toilets. And I'd, then I'd get my two minute Maggi noodles. I mean, it wasn't the ideal nutrition. I mean, it's not stuff we advocate. Good old, the good old Maggi noodles. Yeah, man. I remember those? The, the yeah. secret, <laughs> you got to mix the chicken and the beef. That's a crazy combo. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's crazy. Just growing up also in the Western suburbs, work ethic, being raised by my sister essentially, who took me as a little pet project. And um, I'd be given... 
the best that, that they could provide. So like the sacrifices were made to ensure that, um, that, you know, I was given everything. And although we didn't have loads of things and by, you know, definitely very, by, by all means, definitely didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth. Um, I definitely say that I was extremely privileged and extremely blessed and gifted to have and spoilt to have uh, everything that I had uh, and, and currently have, mm -hmm. especially based on the sacrifices they run around. I, I think, I think, um, you know, obviously, you know, for those listeners out there that don't know, like, um, like what part of the Western suburbs did you grow up in, in Sydney? Auburn, the hood. Auburn. Yeah. So, and, and so I grew up around like Strathfield and Burwood. Yeah. So, you know, Auburn station was about four or five stations the other way. Right. And so it's a very like, you know, culturally, it's a very, um, you know, hard work ethic. It's a grind. You know, I think especially back then there's a lot of crime and, and it wasn't like, it wouldn't be, for example, the place where you would choose to raise your kids. Um, you know, and I think it sounds like, you know, with, with me as well, like, even though, like, you know, we lived in that environment, you know, my, my, my parents were educated and put a big emphasis on that and hard work. And I, I think that, you know, like you obviously, you know, translated into applying that. So like, talk to us a little bit about kind of, you know, that environment, and then obviously, you know, getting into law, like, you know, because a lot of people from, from those type of environments don't make it. Yeah. Mm. And look, Auburn, Auburn, I really missed, you know, Auburn, the hood, we call it, you know, <laughs> we just joke around. We call I remember, it. I remember, I remember catching a train, like I'd catch a train um, from Strathfield station to Auburn because then I'd walk from there to um, the, the basketball uh, Parramatta basketball stadium. And, you know, you'd, you'd get off and it's like, okay, who, who's going to try and fight me today? <laughs> you know, j just, just between the walk from there to there, it was, it was very much that, that um, 1990s kind of uh, culture you know, don't know what it's like today. But what's crazy is when you grow up in it, you're kind of a little bit oblivious to it. You just, it, it's strange. It shapes you in this slightly subconscious mm. way where you're, you're immersed in it so much that you're a, a little bit uh, impervious to it all. And so for, for it to fully, you know, penetrate through into the, the different subcultures that existed in, in Auburn back then, um, mm. I suppose there was people that pursued the path of crime and then there were people who, admire that maybe the possessions that those people had and then would then aspire to emulate a lot of that kind of behavior whereas with me so, man, yeah, they'd, they'd start up their own cartel <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> much, that's how drive-by started to eventually yeah. and, and uh, molotov yep. cocktail bombs yeah so um man my i was just you know i've massively scared shitless of my sister and you know my my parents and stuff i was just this massive pleaser so I wasn't naturally that good at school. I was more of the um, the kid that played a lot of sports and, you know, did stuff outside. And um, I was going around, you know, selling and trading basketball cards and and, and, and oh. rug rugby league cards and that kind of stuff. I was just more of a street. I remember that. Yeah, I was just like a street kid. I definitely was not part of the gifted and talented club. You know, there was those kids. And I was but you, know, you, know what, you know what that shows hearing that though? The hustle. Because I, I have a lot of people, I actually had someone to me yesterday say that, you know, man, you're just such a hustler. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I thought about that. And, you know, like now, like, you know, kind of at not the end of that road, but when you've kind of gone through it for like, you know, 15, 20 years, you don't realize that that upbringing playing blows with basketball cards and, and football cards, you know, to, to, to trade them and then win them, then get the packet and stuff like that. Like, that kind of forge, I think, a lot of that entrepreneurial spirit. It's um, without even realizing. Yeah, look, there's a lot of focus on entrepreneurialism now, and the word hustlers kind of become this. It's got positive. It wasn't even thing. around back then. Uh, not really, man. Like you know, we just did didn't what even we know did. what that was. Yeah, we just kind of did what we did because that's just you know what what we pass time with man and that's how you got a little bit of money to, to go buy your next set of basketball cards or you know that's how you, i saved up money or a pair of pump. jordans yeah reebok pumps they were man reebok pumps they made, <laughs> they made you jump higher yeah <laughs> so i thought but um definitely the work ethic kicked in a little bit later on i didn't even know it maybe i talked about the subconscious mm. you know they talk about subconscious you know there's a lot of oh definitely, definitely. you read a lot it was of this programming part. it was it was programming it was layering you know definitely. you don't even realize it until you get old 100% agree with you, but you, you got to understand, you know, when people talk about being in an environment where you just, you absorb things, whether consciously or subconsciously, um, 
things just start to, to happen. And you talked about programming, neuro-linguistic programming, you know, absorbing, mm-hmm. being a, a product of your environment. I'm a massive believer in all of that stuff. You go, you hang out with people. They just want to go to the pub and drink beers at three o'clock in the afternoon because I've got those mates, you know, they're, yeah. Yeah, they're, in the, the, they're in the trades, you know, and that's their life, you know, and they're, they're our age now, Dane, and, you know, they're about 152 kilos um, with high cholesterol. And that's fine. And, and like, you know, I think that... I think it's, you know, in that type of environment, you can go either go one of two ways. I think you 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 said it quite elegantly before talking about you can either um, um, envy it or aspire to have it, you know. Um, and I think you know, ironically, you know, we didn't even know this about each other until we started speaking. But I think we were two people that were in a similar environment. Like I remember, um, I had a, a friend at school, and his dad was the architect for Centerpoint Tower, right? And he had a Lamborghini. And it was the, you know, he was like the richest kid in school. And a lot of kids used to like kind of, you know, have this jealousy thing. But I'd go there and I remember going to his house and I'd be like, wow, like I'm going to do this one day. I was like nine years old. I don't even know why I thought that at nine, but I thought that, Um, you know, and I, I, I was like appreciative of it. And kind of, I think, you know, that's where that subconscious layering and that programming without even realizing it you know you're kind of setting in motion a series of events that one day lead to your reality um as you go through the journey of life getting philosophical here but you know no i'm I'm massively into that kind of stuff and nature versus nurture and i I feel that there are some things that, that some people intrinsically have as part of their dna and for me one of those things is ambition like i'm constantly i'm Dude, you know me, man. I'm like one of the most competitive yeah. motherfuckers. You put me in a room, I want to win. You put me in an octagon with like Conor McGregor and I will delusionally think that I could win, you know? And <laughs> I can't, like that, that, that's, just, that's just my mentality. And sometimes it, it's paid off in big ways. And other mm. times I've learned lessons from it. I'll never say I failed. I've learned lessons from it. And like going yeah. back to your topic about your, your concept of neuro, uh, linguistics and neuro-linguistics, I'm a firm believer of words um mm. words control our thoughts and thoughts control our actions so it's very important to, to use the right words and not use words like failure or any words that might you know be the catalyst for any type of toxic thoughts it's, it's, it's uh, really really important for me man and that's for any listeners out there that are listening and think you are what you think you are what you well this is the thing you can only th- have certain thoughts if you have the right words the right vocabulary to be able to articulate those thoughts because thoughts are a form of silent articulation and so if you can have certain thoughts that are then controlled by the words you decide to use your thoughts then dictate your actions right so it's like this holy trinity of crazy shit that needs to come together to ensure that you are on the trajectory for for success and ambition but ambition is something that I've seen it, man. It's hard to fucking teach that shit, man. So like you either have ambition- and It's a, a double-edged it. double sword too. You know, I, I think that the, the thing I've learned, you know, and I've, I've had two massive kinds of burnouts in my thirties, you know, one at the beginning of my thirties and one, two years ago. And it was from, it was from that subconscious programming of just ambition, ambition, ambition. But I think it's, you know, what I've learned is the balance, you know, like, um, you know, how can, how can I balance that out again? So that, you know, when I wake up every day, am I truly happy? You know, because if I'm truly happy and and following my passion, even if I have a little bit less money in the bank, which is what a lot of people determine as success, I've learned that that's not the case as I'm sure you have. Mm. Um, But you know, that's just, that's just uh, one metric. Mm. Um, But talk to us like, you know, obviously coming from that environment, like how did you go into law? And then, you know, obviously, how did you go from working in a, you know, a corporate environment and doing that to saying one day, you know, fuck this, I'm going to go start a supplement company. Yeah, man, the, the Cliff Notes version of it, um, the, the, the quick little summary was like I mentioned before, wasn't that good at school, naturally, um, wanted to become an NBA basketball player, I was playing uh, reps for Parramatta Wildcats. Um, then my dad had a massive heart attack when I was in year nine at the age of 47, he was dead wow. for 10, he was dead for 10 minutes and then he was brought back. Um, and so that was this huge life changing moment for me because my family is just me, my sister, my mom and my dad. So, you know, I know it sounds a little bit sexist now and stuff. It's 2021. So you gotta be a bit careful what you say, but I was like, 
the man of the house. You know, I'm just yeah, quite quite yeah. sensitive to that stuff. I've got three daughters, you know, so well, of course, two and a half ones. One's going to be born in May, but um, I was the man of the house, and you know, the traditional approach is that the man's the protector right. and provider and all this stuff. And I was just like, okay, fuck, these are huge responsibilities on my shoulders. Now I get it. What Dad was talking about. You know, basketball, I injure myself or whatever. Like, will it pay the bills? Will it keep the the lights on in the house? And at that time, it didn't. So that was this huge life-changing moment for me when I decided to actually pay attention in school and have some type of aspirations where I could have a career where I could then provide for my family as step one and step two is kind of make a difference. So I just started to listen and realize the way I learn really, really well is by is by human interaction like I, I i really struggled to read and the reason i didn't read was because of my huge struggling with it and now when i speak and explain my situation it's undiagnosed dyslexia mild form of it so when i see words like i if you told me to spell us but they didn't know they didn't know that back then they didn't know that if you asked me to spell a word like yeah. consequence i wouldn't be able to just spell it for you mm. For example, I can spell cat, dog. They're sim- like I can't. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to spell that for you. Same things when I see the word now with a whole bunch of words. To me, it looks jumbled. So I've developed my own hacks and stuff to be able to read and shit. But like, I learn a lot just from listening and human interaction and just yeah, being like realize whatever I kind of listen to, I remember really really well. So I went from being middle of the grade to coming first in every subject by at the end of year 10 so it just goes to show to all listeners out there especially any any young ones or anyone who's got kids mm. that are struggling in a certain area don't think that the orthodox approach of um studying or, or progression and the same thing applies to fitness too it's like hey your chest isn't growing well fuck man maybe just get off the bench press maybe and try something else try some flies try some plyometrics you know let's drop the drop the heavy oh, low weights and try more volume you know a hundred percent. I mean, you know, obviously I went down the formal education path like you and, and obviously, you know, we're, we're here, like we, we, we started an education company and kind of teach, you know, thousands of students around the world. And one of the things that I always say is like, do I regret going to uni? No. But if I had to do it again, would I have placed as much emphasis on it? And the answer would be no, because I, I, I think that the traditional um, learning route does have its, um, does have its merits. But the reality, there's a lot to be said for EQ, you know, yeah, that emotional true. intelligence, that, that street smarts. Um, because I've found that the most successful people in any industry, unless you're in like pure research or a very technical, like maybe an engineer or something like that, are people that blend kind of academics with um, logic, i.e. being practical with how they apply it. Um, and I think, you know, even for a lot of fitness professionals out there that are listening, you know, they might've just done their cert three, cert four in fitness, but is you and I both know lots of PTs around the world, um, that, you know, might not have a formal qualification, but they're multimillionaires oh, because yeah. they've been out. Mm. We know, you know them because know who they are. Yeah. We're, we're like we, we know them, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you, you know, intimately. And, yeah. and, and so, you, you know, that's, um, I think, yeah, for a lot of listeners out there, it's like, um you know, not to get caught up in necessarily the dogmatic approach to success because you're, you're proof with dyslexia, with, you know, late start in high school in terms of applying yourself, but that, mm. that, that pathway doesn't always yield a, you know, successful outcome. 100%. And uh, look, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, that most things can be, can be learned if you decide to just focus on them. So that piece of self-awareness, you know, you talked about the IQ versus EQ. For me, I, I wouldn't say I had the best natural like social skills or interpersonal skills and stuff. Um, and even like I, I'm still learning every day. You just have to be a student of studying human behavior. And like one little tip I'll share with, with the listeners today is that one of the biggest things I did to really um, hone my art or skills in terms of human interaction and EQ is to really study how other people behave, how they talk and their actions and observe what I like. So an example to give you is I've, as a person, like as a, you know, I've been with my wife, Katie, for, you know, I first met her when she was like 22. So like 14 years almost. And um, 
we i've never done the whole opening door off the car and all that stuff you know it's just just, it wasn't i just didn't naturally think about doing that kind of stuff ever and we had this athlete from from the states his name was aaron shoemaker and uh his girlfriend of the time jessica aaron would open the door for her every time like they'd get into a car get out of the car and i thought to myself what a lovely thing to do like how must jessica feel when he does that do you know what I decided to do? Because I admired that. I decided to emulate and replicate his behavior. And as humans, you know, there's a lot of this whole concept of don't be a sheep, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? Fucking if the sheep's doing some good shit, ah. you admire, be the fucking sheep, man. <laughs> uh, look, 100%, I agree on that. And and most of that stuff, by the you know, by the way, for like, you know, listeners out there, it's, it's just a process of repeating habits. You, you, you can train that, you know, that, that whole concept of neuroplasticity that you spoke about before, whether it's as, as a coach or in your business or whatever it is, like if you're not strong at something, just start doing it and doing it every day, you know, make it, make it become a new habit. Yeah. Massively, man. And so kind of appropriating that kind of taking, taking that whole concept to, to school, um, and, and studies, yeah, applied it and it, things became a habit. So whatever, my weakness was, say, English. I just wrote like essay after essay after essay. The point where I had these like template essays, irrespective of whatever question would be asked in the HSC, the final year 12 exam, I could spit out one of my essays and still end up getting a decent mark, although that was my huge weakness, right? So um, I did that. I did my HSC, did, did my chemistry HSC one year early, um, Came, got a pretty good mark, came, came second in, in the state for that. Uh, I taught myself chemistry when I was in year 10. I used to read my sister's um, chemistry textbooks and kind of learn through the pictures because the periodic table is pictures. And that was pretty, pretty easy for me to learn that. So that was my real passion for science. I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon because my dad had this huge heart attack. And so yeah. I wanted to then perform yeah. open heart surgery on people and help people like the doctor who helped my dad. Um, and then when I finished my HSC, I got a mark that would allow, uh, allow me to go and do whatever course I wanted without my parents having to pay any money, um, which is pretty cool. And I wanted to go and do med. Med was the obvious option. So I enrolled in med. And instead of doing schoolies, for any listeners out there from different countries or, or wherever, schoolies is what um, high school kids that just finished their year 12 final year study go up to uh, from, from Sydney generally, fly up to the Gold Coast, and just create havoc. Um, so instead of doing that, I went with my grandmother to Fiji and we went into the rural parts of Fiji where her brothers and sisters are. And the her brothers and sisters, like their great, great grandparents would have been the people who inherited the land or earned the land. Um, and they didn't realize, but they actually got shafted because the land wasn't, it wasn't Torrens title transfer of land. It was actually done as a, a, a 99 year perpetually yeah, renewable. Nice well, perpetually renewable lease that records has been going for 300 years now, but it was approaching, I think it's third term. So 99, 99, 99. And the government had proposed to reclaim that land. And so I was sitting down and they've worked the sugarcane fields all day, sitting down, drinking kava, and they brought this topic up and I'm disgusted hearing this stuff. And so they said, they literally pointed the finger and said, you will go become a lawyer and you'll fight to, to, to keep our people's land. Yeah. And oh. when you're from Fiji and yeah. elders around you tell you you're going to do something. You do that. That's, that's, yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. I don't know if you can see that telling you guys this story. Yeah. And um, that holiday ended, came back, uh, enrolled at Sydney Uni Law School um, and ditched medicine, did the law thing. And that's how I fell into that, man. And I got sucked into the vortex. So whatever, ambition, got to get the best, you know, enjoy uni. First uni was actually really fun and, and relatively like simple because it was like I had subjects like economics and the law is, is, all, is all storytelling. It's all about precedence and telling telling stories about what happened. So it was easy stuff for me to remember. It became harder when I had to read fed, federal constitutional law. That was a bit of a struggle. But um, that was a law path. Ended up getting getting pretty good marks. Um, got, I graduated first class honours and I got... Um, got headhunted or whatever poached through the whole clerkship program through into a top tier corporate law firm called Clayton Newts doing private equity and mergers and acquisitions law. Wow. Okay. Like 
That sounds, you, you know, you went down the very academic path, but even just listening to you speak is it's very, you're very mindful, you're very reflective, and you have a lot of experience um, in life behind you, um, which is, I guess, what led to the career path change for you as well. Um, there's a lot of listeners out there because they now know from your story that you did have a law background. Can you just run us through a sort of day in a life of your former corporate self would have looked like? Because you would have been, you know, sitting there 12 to 16 hour days, which would have led to the burnout. So do you want to just talk to us about that? Because I find that that's probably really relatable to a lot of people out there thinking this sounds like me and what do I do? So um, I'll let you have the floor on that one. Yeah. I wake up in the morning and you kind of feel a bit shit because you have to go in into work. So that feeling yep. of like, I'm doing something that I'm not truly happy with mm -hmm. probably the best way to describe that chuck on a shirt try and find one that's not creased wear a suit catch the bus into the city from I was living in Randwick then um get in go to the cafe get some toast with lots of butter and lots of Vegemite um double shot <laughs> very Aussie of you. yeah thank you I <laughs> have lots of that habit and then um, get get planted in my seat and pretty much smash out billables. And what a billable is, it's a, it's a six minute increment that as a lawyer, you have to charge a client for every, you're accountable for every six minutes of your life per day. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, I'd be at work till, um, it'd be pretty stressful, like it's nonstop, just like on documents and, you know, discovery process or due diligence processes. And yeah, it was a really good day, like an early finish if I got to leave the office at 9.30 p.m. Um, most mm -hmm. standard finishes would be about 10, 11, like a late night would be no sleep, don't go home. Uh, but yeah, during three or four in the morning, sometimes during a big transaction. So it's, yeah, really mm -hmm. full on big hours and um, not the most rewarding like work, not, not talking about financial reward. I'm talking about just that feeling that you get because you're able to act genuinely make a difference. But yeah. Yeah, we were just kind of putting words on a piece of paper that that really only mattered if it ever went to litigation. So mm -hmm. yeah, it didn't really feel like I was doing anything too compelling or or, or impactful. So then, how did you know know that you had burnout per se? Like, were you diagnosed, or what were the symptoms, and what led you, I guess, be um, come to know that you had an autoimmune disease, which I guess mm -hmm. clinically is what burnout actually is in on paper. So I'm, I'm actually really grateful that, that I've got um, auto, like I've got Crohn's slash colitis. I'm really grateful uh -huh. that it's that and it's not anything. It's not the other C word um, because that's what they thought it was when I had um, blood that would come out when I went to the bathroom. Like you could literally fill up a cup of blood. That's how much blood would be coming out of me about 15 times a day. And my normal athletic, you know, fit is that trains and stuff and play sports. My normal body weight's about 110, 112 kilos. And I dropped down in a really short period of time, like down to about 80, 82 kilos. So, so like wow, at awesome. my height, at my size, that's, that's pretty bony. Um, gaunt. Yeah. Well, sorry. What was that Dane? Would have been gaunt on your frame. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, man. Definitely. You can yeah. see the, you could definitely see the high cheekbones and the jawline back then. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's, it, it was a challenging time in my life because I battled through that feeling of having a dagger in my stomach and, you know, um, okay. kind of trying to be tough and man up and, you know, go to work every day and not, not talk about how you're feeling. Um, so that they you know, like I, I, some days I'd wake up in the morning in the fetal position because I was in that much pain. Like there was a dagger in my stomach and you still get up uh, and, and go do your thing. So I think that taught me a lot of resilience and um, yeah, just being able to battle through the pain. I think that's, you know, mm -hmm. I know, I know in my bodybuilding world and also like a long distance runners, it's about crossing that threshold of pain and being able to endure pain. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sounds like it sounds like you're talking about David Goggins there and his yeah. mindset. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Look, he's he's a pretty amazing dude, you know. Mm. Definitely not at his level of uh, you know, being able to endure pain. But um, yeah, I, I went through my own kind of stuff and it does make you a lot stronger, you know, like you you mm. just definitely a lot more resilient. Yeah. And um you sort of touched upon it there, but was going to the gym a part of your routine, which is what led you onto that path to go down the fitness health route and then start EHP labs or what was it for you that where's the link with fitness? Yeah. I fell in love with the gym. The first gym I joined uh, was 
the first ever fitness first that opened up in Australia in Auburn as mm-hmm. part of this huge mega complex. And when I finished school, I kind of abused my body after letting, leaving the basketball kind of career behind. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I, you could, you could potentially define it as a bit of an eating disorder that I would only reward myself by having a break. If it was justified by eating. So I wouldn't like, I'm going to study and the only break I'll have is while I'm eating. Mm-hmm. So what's the hack around that? The hack around that is <laughs> you're always fucking eating. So you can always have a break. So um, <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> and so, um, and um, my parents were working all the time, and just there's just a lack of awareness around kind of nutrition and those kinds of things, you know, in my family. So um, I put on a lot of weight by the time I finished school, uh, sitting at, you know, the 125 kilo mark. And, um, you know, for, for most boys out there that are getting into uni, it's like this this uh what do you call it it's almost like this kind of metamorphosis it's, it's, it's pickup time it, yeah man it's this metamorphosis of like kind of leaving the area your little school network yeah. and blah 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 and like oh my god this is the world and it's the kind of like first time i really started paying attention to girls like i was a bit of a late bloomer like you know so focused on basketball and my study is like i was never really like interested in trying to be attractive to the opposite sex Um, and so at that time I became really self-conscious and, you know, tried every fad diet under the sun, I joined the gym. Mom took me down to fitness first. I got a lot of confidence, you know, met the bros. They introduced me to, um, back then like protein powder. And I remember walking in buying tubs and tubs of this optimum nutrition gold standard protein, (laughs) five tubs of this shit because Jimmy from vitamin King in Maryland gave me five bucks off a tub. If I bought five, Jack, 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 Jimmy. (laughs) <laughs> so um, <laughs> jimmy grasso that he's, he's like a legend yeah. of in australia um and people didn't understand like supplements and stuff back then you know my mum thought i was taking steroids because my body just like responded immediately to training and just cleaning up my mm. diet and i fell in love with fitness and bodybuilding so before instagram and all this stuff was cool back when i was 18 19 i'm 30 37 now um yeah but yeah, almost 18 years ago, 19 years ago is when I first fell in love with the discipline of the gym, the endorphins, the feeling, the changes that happen in your body and your ability to tweak certain things in your diet, your nutrition and how you supplement. So people like us. Well, I think back then with like, uh, as well, like this is early noughties, right? And, you know, you, you, you're on bodybuilding.com, T Nation, you know, BioTest, all those supplements there. It was, it was very like, in the health and fitness world, it was literally you had limited options. A lot of them were offshore, and a, a lot of them were jacked up with so much stuff that you know, like they might as well have been like a low-grade anabolic. Like you know, you take a super pump or something like that. I remember I used to, you know, take that pre-workout. Like honestly, I I felt like I'd gone out to a rave um, by the time I finished the workout. I've been going to the toilet, man, when I took that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there was uh, way yeah. too high levels of maltodextrin in that. Um, yeah. The crazy thing was, like, for me, I found that, like, supplements, and this is where the love of gym and training, what benefits it provided me with discipline, mindset, changing my physique, and being able to control that was crazy. Like, when I first realized, yeah. fuck, I can control, like, what I look like. I can bring about these changes was mind-blowing for me. And then I discovered supplements and I was like, shit, I can mm. take this stuff that makes me better than what I am if I don't take them. Like, you know, obviously the, all the kind of legal and natural supplements. So I was like, fell in love with like protein powder. I fell in love with pre-workouts. I fell in love with, you know, thermogenics. Just it made me better and it gave me the edge. I've always been mm-hmm. that. I've always wanted to be better and always had the edge. And that's the, where that passion came about. And then so when I got sick, I was just like, cool. And I was in hospital um kind of like five years into law i eventually got hospitalized in and out yeah. for a year and i was like i actually thought i was dying one day i must have been that jacked up in morphine because you can control it. i was just like pressing this drip and like, i was real high in morphine and i thought i was dying that day and i did this little prayer to god and i said to god god if you give me a second chance if i get better enough if i walk out of here i promise you i will dedicate my life to helping other people become better Mm-hmm. through their own actions of health and nutrition to avoid metabolic disease and and to uh, to avoid getting sick as opposed to trying to cure that shit so we then um 
I got out like a couple of days later and was walking with my wife's help because I was still real weak through Randwick, the area we lived in. And this shop that was opposite of Fitness First, like was literally coming up for lease. And like everything was a sign, you know, when like you have such a great um, like willpower where like, I know it sounds cuckoo, but like you talk to the universe and you just put stuff out there, stuff starts to come back. No, yeah. I mean, look, it's it's the law, law of I mean, law of attraction, whatever you want to call it. Like, uh, look, I'm very big on that, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, energy, what you put out comes back, and and how you manifest your reality. Um, I, I've seen it happen in my life over and over and over again. I think, you know, where when it doesn't happen that way for people is when they resist it. They resist that intuition. They resist the signs and signals. You know, and uh, like, I mean even though you and I have spoken quite a few times, I've never actually heard this story. And, um, you know, even just hearing it, though, I can kind of see that, you know, coming out of hospital, you've been unwell for a year, walking past, you said Randwick Fitness first? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, seeing a, a, a shop up for lease, like um, it would have been a moment. So we ran that shop for, for three months just as a, as a retailer and um, to learn the ins and outs of business. I never run a shop or did business before. So it's just really helping the community. And what I realized by helping the community was there's this massive category for weight loss, or weight management, healthy weight management. And a lot of those ingredients with my kind of chemistry background, I was like, one, three, dimethylmillamine. Okay, that, that's not good. Like that's, that actually places pressure on the heart. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, and then I was looking, so okay, 400 milligrams of caffeine. That's not good. And so I was recommending, yeah, you remember the products back in the day, man. So. <laughs> Even just remembering that that's like a week's worth, you know, like 400, yeah. like one scoop, 400 milligrams. So, so yeah, back then there was all this capsule based dodgy shit that was coming into the country. So I was really off mm. that. And then that was a real catalyst to want to get out and create something that was a lot better than what was being offered to the market and being able to adopt all the early stage social media marketing skills that we got because we had no money and we didn't know how to market. So we intrinsically just became quite savvy at social media community building. Well, that's, that's, that's one question I'll, I'll, I'll stop you on because I think like for a lot of fitness professionals out there, you know, this whole kind of influencer marketing, right. The, the, you know, wh whether they're in gyms or just the whole concept of fitness influencers, like, you know, you were, to my knowledge, one of the earliest, earlier adopters of that. If anything, you know, from afar, I saw it and, and started kind of mimicking it in around 2014. I reckon you would have been about 2012, 2013. We were 20, um, yeah, 20, 2012, we first, 2013. Uh, 2012, we started doing it with the retail shop DNA. And then we rolled yeah. out the same strategy with EHP. Like, talk to us about that. Obviously, that was quite an innovative, like, marketing approach that I really feel you know, like a brand like yours or like Gymshark has done it really well as well. Like um, talk to us about like, you know, how that came to be and, and kind of like, how is that playing out today for you guys too? Funny you mentioned that. So Lewis Morgan's actually a good friend of mine, one of the founders of Gymshark. And we, we started pretty much at the same time with similar marketing strategies. Um, mm. It was, man, we kind of just fell into it. Like, I'm not going to say there was some crazy strategy or we, we knew what we were doing. We just... Mm. We, we didn't have money to go into glossy mags and stuff like that. Um, and we were so focused on being able to help people. And I help think them. especially back then it was still, it, it was pre digital. So it was a very kind of um, paper in your hand based marketing approach for supplement companies. You know, you'd get the, you'd get the latest issue of like, you know, iron, <laughs> uh, like the, the different magazines at the time that are out there and you'd go through and look at all the supplements like, wow, oh, you know, I want to try this one or this one, or, you know, you have like the Gaspari stuff. And this and that and, you know. So, so, so that was one of the, the, the biggest kind of misconceptions that existed back then, or maybe, maybe it was right. I don't know. We, we thought it was just, you know, like this is eventually going to fade up, but you weren't a proper, proper supplement brand. If you weren't in a glossy mag, if you weren't in muscle and fitness, if you weren't in yeah. flex, if you weren't in yeah. muscle and development, you weren't a proper yeah. supplement brand. And we were almost like laughed at and belittled for a long time by the industry. It's like, oh yeah, they're just this, you know, social media brand, like, oh yeah, whatever. Oh, they got these like, you know, little skinny kids, you know, these massive bodybuilders. And a lot of them are my friends. Like I'm, I won't mention their names, but they are like yeah. 
rugby level athletes who are my friends, close friends of mine, who would la- who would tease me about the athletes that we have in our team. And little do they know that these amazing people that were part of our, our team EHP had audience communities that trusted them, added value to their communities, would mm. teach their communities stuff. And ultimately, whatever they recommended their communities, the communities would listen because they actually had such a genuine caring personality. And the, the problem with your traditional, not the problem, one of the one of maybe the 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 downfalls in in the traditional style, it's all changed now. But back then the traditional body was like, this is me, I've won first place or second place at Olympia and just based on how awesome I am and the fact that I pretend I take this, you should like, you know, buy this product. I mean, that level of, um, I suppose, it, it's so contrived. Like when you look at that, whereas what we want to work with is people who actually take our products, people yeah. who actually genuinely have transformed yeah. their lives based on using, using our stuff. Yeah, man. And so early stage story, there's a girl who's in Bondi and she had 50,000 followers on fans on Facebook. This is pre-Instagram fans on Facebook. Um, and she would, we got introduced to her, I don't know, randomly. She came into the store one time and she said her name and all this stuff. From her. And um, back then there used to be these like protein custard things by MHP. Um, I think they're still around. Maybe they're gone. But told her, grab a few from, you know, the fridge. Thank you so much for coming in. Didn't even ask her to do anything. Do you know what this girl did? She was the loveliest girl. She went and she took a photo. She posted onto her, her Facebook page, reached 50,000 people and said, if you ever need of any subs, the best people, the best advice, the best supplements at DNA Randwick. And dude, like I didn't know. I was just like, oh, what a nice girl. Fuck, like literally like that week we had people. I love these stories, honestly. It's a new okay. shop. Yeah. It's a new shop. Like we just opened this freaking store, man. And like most stores, the retail stores don't make any money for like for the first, first two year. years. Mm-hmm. We, we, we cracked a hundred K in our third month running this shop, you know, like, like for that month, mm. it was just like, like mind blowing for us. I mean, margins were nothing. Like, I think I couldn't even pay myself, but still it's great progress. Right. And yeah, so yeah. People were driving in from all over town, Campbelltown. That's a long drive to, to Randwick. Like you're talking about a 50 minute drive, Wollongong, like an hour and a half drive, Newcastle, a three hour drive to come to the store that this girl, Sarah, told them to come to and i was just like this is crazy and they weren't leaving with like 100 bucks with supplements they were leaving with 800 bucks with supplements because they drove so far i was like this is mental so then i started getting serious to do reviews for us on new brands that we we're bringing in and then all of a sudden like these new brands we just couldn't keep enough of that stock and i realized well okay like reality check here one like they're not the best products we can make better stuff and two if we genuinely like sent Sarah the products and she liked them, then fingers crossed, this thing might, might work, you know, um, mm. just sell it, sell it in our shop. And so that was the idea of creating a brand in America. You know, we've got an LLC set up in Delaware and then bringing it through and positioning it to rub shoulders with the other big US brands, the other big giants, but be the best product on the shelf. That So would you, would you say that um, obviously you know, would you say that the influencer marketing, which you kind of, as, I mean, that story was right. You kind of just fell into it. it, it wasn't, that term didn't even exist back then. You know, it was literally uh, someone with some fans yeah. sh- shared your business. Would you say that that kind of really, you know, catapulted and got your brand out there a lot quicker than say a lot of your rivals or contemporaries at the time um, and kind of was a, a key pivotal instigator to long-term success of where you're at today? Yeah, definitely look, I played a massive role. Um, you, you've got to, you, you've got to look at where, where their attention is, you know? So like if somebody was to go and try and do that on Facebook now, it's not really going to get the traction that we got. It's where like, you've got to look at yeah. the, the currency of, of mo- like modern day currencies is, 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 is attention. You know, a lot of people. Very different now. Yeah, a lot of people. So much. That. So from from our perspective, it was just like back then, um, cool. We then pivoted very quickly off Facebook and brought the attention into Instagram and went really, really deep in Instagram and grew a following really fast. And that gave us um, just brand like credibility and proof of concept. So we we're able to say, hey, like we have this many followers in our community. Like 
you know, this is the size and scale of our brand, but then simultaneously we were doing global expos. We're doing eight, eight expos around the world, Olympia, Arnold, Body Power, LA Fit Expo, San Jose Fit Expo, New Zealand Fit Expo, uh, Filex, FitEx, you name it, man. Um, and we did that. We, we hustled. We brought our brand to life at those expos. So we weren't just regarded to be this internet company. We wanted to bring the brand to life. And um, yeah, that's, that's also what helped us to, to create this omni-channel sales marketing strategy where we have what they call D2C, like direct-to-consumer through e-commerce. But then also DSD, which is direct sales distribution, where we own and control all the distribution entities in whatever country we're in. We own the entire vertical and we then get to help the retailer by offering them better margins, but also control um, who gets our product and, you know, how they represent our brand uh, to the consumer. It's been that really regimented, um, controlled uh, approach Mm. to business that's allowed us to not fold and not fumble. We haven't, we could have signed a deal with GNC and bodybuilding.com back in 2014 when in 13, we had two tables. That was our booth at Olympia. In 2014, we were the we were the Olympia sponsors. Our brand was like up on the banners at the yeah. LA at the Vegas Convention Center on the outside windows. Like we were the brand sponsor, of this mega booth in one year, and we had Bodybuilding.com, we had GNC, and we had uh, Europa fighting out with Muscle Foods. They're the two big distributors in the US. And that year, we forecasted that if we did that, uh, the revenue for that year would have been say what we did last so what we did last year and so we've kind of foregone for the longevity of the brand we've foregone almost four or five years in the growth and development of building sustainable revenue so that whatever we did last year we can apply a percentage growth to that and be at that level this financial year and then apply that and be somewhere else in the future as opposed to do that and then that go up and then just crash down well, talk to us about the, and I think, you know, coming back to obviously the products, you know, so whether it's, you know, whether it's a trainer that's got an online program, like it's a product, you know, obviously your guys' products are, are, are tangible um, items that they can, um, you know, utilize. Like, you know, how many products did you launch initially when you started? And talk to us a little bit about that, that process to where you're at today with such a you know, suite of products, like, you know, for listeners out there, that are saying, you know, like that haven't, for example, if they live under a rock, haven't heard about EHP Labs. Like what makes your products better than a competitor's for, for mm-hmm. argument's sake? So a couple of questions there. So the first bit was what do we first launch with? It was um, OxyShred, um, which is still our flagship product to this day. We are on track for our, yeah, I think it's going to be in approximately August. We're forecasting. 6 million units of oxy shred have been manufactured and sold in that period of time, which, wow. which is, which is it's amazing. Pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty awesome to hear that number. Um, so initially it's just oxy shred, two flavors, pink grapefruit and wild melon were my two first formulations there. And then we had a pre-workout that was a bit ahead of its time. It was a 14 and a half gram scoop back in the time when everyone was doing nano scoop, micro scoop, tiny three gram scoops, we had like a fully efficaciously dosed pre-workout uh, called buzz pre-workout. And a lot of the inspiration behind our recent pre-workout drop pride has been from what was in buzz to create a completely holistic, compelling, you know, pre-workout that's, that's properly scientifically dosed for each and every ingredient that we've got in there. And I think that that word you just used then holistically, I mean, I know from you guys that a lot of your, you know, one of your points of difference is that, you know, with your background and obviously the health stuff that you've gone through when you were younger as a lawyer, like your supplements aren't just your typical bodybuilding supplements. They're as much for performance as they are for internal health. Yeah, man. Um, hundred percent. So look, having an autoimmune disease and being a user of all of our products, um, I want to make sure that they don't have certain uh, inflammatory marker ingredients in there. Uh, even our oxy way at the moment, uh, we've removed um, micellar casein from there. And I'm, I'm not being a hater of micellar casein, but mm. I've read too many compelling clinical research papers about micellar casein being an inflammatory marker and actually being one of the kind of key, key precursors to 
cell mutations or cancer. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to fuck with that shit. So we took that out um, a couple of years ago and it's now the first uh, Oxyway is the first lean wellness protein on the market. Mm -hmm. So we've got lactobacillus rhamnosus mm -hmm. in there. Lactobacillus rhamnosus is a super probiotic. We've got um, our own patented digestive enzyme blend in there, as well as a full B vitamin uh, matrix, as um, and also alkalizing vitamins and minerals. So it's not just the protein, man. Um, so super yeah. proud of that. Uh, and as you said, man, look, our suite of products is quite comprehensive at the moment. We range across post-workout um, hydrolyzed isolate protein. That's called isopept. We've got a lean wellness protein, OxyWay. We've got blessed plant-based protein that's absolutely crushing it at the moment um, yep. because of because of how the super high quality uh, um, golden shell pea protein that we use that actually delivers a 90% protein output with high levels of proline. And one of the, one of the um, biggest criticisms towards pea protein or plant-based protein is they're not complete proteins, meaning that they lack right. some yep. amino acids. So yeah. the fact we've found one that's actually got high levels of proline there is pretty awesome and they taste incredible. Um, Oxy Shred, Oxy Shred Hardcore, Oxy Shred Non-Stim for, you know, whatever tickles your fancy. If you need a little bit more stim and crazy, crazy focus, then go with Hardcore. If you love the OG, that's just the flagship and then Non-Stims for obviously people who struggle with caffeine. The latest drops been Pride pre-workout with, uh, it's a collab with one of our athletes, Zach Perna. That's incredible. It's just crushing at the moment. Um, and we've got a few awesome special things rolling out this year, man. So a carbonated OxyShred RTD in a can. It's going to be found in all gyms and supplement stores. So you can sip on your OxyShred nice and cold and fizzy. That can pre-workout thing is, is, is very trendy at the moment. It's in every fridge. It's good that yeah. you're on that. It is. <laughs> it, it is. And I think what's going to be quite... Um, the USP or the, the differentiator of, of what will be oxy shred energy, we call energy to burn. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll tagline. The cool thing about it is there's no other a carbonated, you know, energy drink that's got one and a half yeah. grams of acetyl or carnitine in there that, that ours has. So it doesn't, you don't just get the, the energy from the caffeine that goes and hits your adrenal glands. You're actually mobilizing fat cells in your blood. Fatty acids. Yeah. That, that drives into mitochondria to create natural energy. That's an amazing feeling. So the same feels that people are getting on one scoop of OxyShred, they'll get the same, mm. those same feels when they drink a can of OxyShred energy. Are you hands-on is in the whole process in terms of the formula? Because given your background in chemistry and even the way you speak so seamlessly, I know obviously you would know the products back to front, but it sounds like you are very involved in the process. Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, so it's um, maybe I'm a little bit possessive in that area, but look, when, when scaling a, a business, um, they say generally the founder will let go of the let go last of the thing that they yeah. love, and that is very true in my case. Like, I look, don't get me wrong, I love marketing and I love sales because for me, sales is being able to communicate what makes our product so special to somebody else, and they go, "Great, I'll buy it." Well, to me, that's why I love sales, but mm -hmm. creating like magical it's the, it's, the, it's, it's it's the ip creation <laughs> and yeah. i i mean i mean that literally i've got uh, 10 or 12 textbooks to knock out this year about two and a half thousand pages of content for our huge and it's like i just can't hand it over yet because it's like the the, the, the masterpiece right? that's huge yeah man and it's kind of crazy because we've got other areas of the business that are so bolstered with amazing teams and there's like you know 108 mm. people in the company now and all this stuff and they're like cool what's the product team and i was like like <laughs> I, I still i still formulate every product and uh flavor every product and that's one area of the business that that is i find super fun and yeah i'm happy to stay up till you know the crazy hours in the morning working on that stuff so mm. yeah. how have you on on that point and i think for you know a, a lot of um, you know, fitness professionals out there or gym owners or whatnot, like talk to us a little bit and you mentioned about kind of, you know, obviously being a founder of a brand and obviously, you know, being in the trenches, doing everything from the, the invoices at the beginning, you know, back in the day in your shop, like taking payments over the EFT to answering the phones to, you know, doing outreach, probably standing at the front of your shop with flyers trying to get people to come into you. Like, how has that process been for you as a founder to go from being jack of all things to just jack of a few things? And you mentioned the word too, letting go. How have you found yeah. it? 
Yeah, look, it's, it's it's the only way to really scale effectively is to to trust people that are like you know better better are you than uh, at that area and like the the ego sometimes comes in and like it'll be like you know like I used to do it this way and the the biggest um, area of growth that I want to share with your listeners is sometimes being able to be humble enough to say, well, no, like maybe today I could help and I think I can do it better, but can I do that consistently and sustainably and actually own that area? No, I can't. So I'm actually doing a disservice to the company. I'm doing a disservice to our customers, to our partners, to our retailers, to you know wh- whoever else we work with in the, in the supply chain. I'm doing a disservice to everyone by having this ego. And mm-hmm. it, you know, you gotta swallow a little bit of a, a pill of humility to say like what what matters here and what matters here is like ultimately building this super compelling culture where we bring on board people that share the same values and mission statement as as us individually and that's what makes our collective mission statement for EHP is that we rise by lifting others and our personal growth comes from the growth of the people around us and that includes our customers but that also includes you know, my friends, like, you know, I'll jump on the phone with, with Dane, if he ever needs anything from me. And mm. we had an incident recently where he dedicated 40 minutes of his time to, to help out a, a family situation that I've got a cousin going through. Um, and that level of helping somebody else rise, you know, that we talked about energy and law of attraction, all that stuff. I also firmly believe in the fact that when you and you guys this is perfect for you guys because you guys are in the education business when you can educate someone and you can empower them to go and do something their potential is limitless you know and like our whole kind of ethos of ehp empowered human potential is our potential is limitless when we're empowered so how do you empower someone you give them the tools you show them how to do it and you let them go and do it and you guide them and you pull them back into track when when they fall off track so um yeah it's that's kind of would you say like obviously you know lots of life lessons would you say like if you could go back to you know yourself at 25 years old now you know and i think especially for a lot of our listeners right now you know who might be pts or fitness professionals at a kind of you know average age in the mid 20s like what what is a what is one thing you would have done differently you know no doubt you're grateful that it happened that way now but it, what would you have done differently to save yourself a bit of that time and heartache uh, yeah for a younger you yeah man look i'm super grateful um for everything that's happened along the way you know like i'm so happy in the seat i'm sitting in right now um i couldn't be any more blessed to have my family my two little girls another girl on the way my wife everything that we have like we're we've got an abundance of things and more than we need um so i'm super grateful for that but just to answer just to answer your question um I'm, you know, I'm not going to be coy and say nothing because I, th- I feel that there's, there should be a better answer. And for, for me, that the best answer to give you, and this is for anyone listening out there, is just go harder, man. Like I just tell myself, go harder. <laughs> honestly, like I'd go fucking harder. Like because I, I feel I could have gone harder. There's two years where I probably did relax. I made so much fucking money, okay. dude. Like where it was just. Well, you know what, it, you know what I think it is as well is as as you and you're coming from the context now and I can get it too. It's like mentally, you know, you don't realize, I think as when you're a younger self, how far you can push yourself mentally. The mental mental is key too, but the other bit is just like, you need to get to point. I was saying before, like I made so much fucking money in a a tiny short period of time where if the goal is just that, then like you almost drop everything else. And so it needs to be way more than that. Everything that comes in now gets, pretty much pretty much 100% reinvested I don't pay myself a salary like I to I prefer to be working the way I am now and I've got so much more satisfaction utility out of what I'm actually doing because I'm being genuine to actual mission and purpose like all my cars all my material crap things that once upon a time I used to feel that defined our success my success all those things have been sold and gone now. And now I wake up every day going, cool, this little rental Mitsubishi ASX that we have till I, till I go overseas. And I'm talking about, you know, the, my passion for cars, Dane. Yeah. So yeah. the stuff I used to drive before all gone now, and I don't care. I feel, I feel like the success of, of, of my success, the success of the company is by seeing my leadership team grow around me, by seeing 
our teammates that we bring into the company and grow the company grow more and millions and millions more customers actually you know trusting and coming on side with the hp and getting their results and changing people's lives like to me that's a groundbreaking point where you reach this epiphany and you say to yourself i wake up in the morning and literally i am working for free people say mm. do what you do you'll find happiness you know and you should do what you do because you could work for free for that oh the reality check is most people won't like that's just a reality check but being fortunate enough to be in the position where i said to myself from last year january because we preempted COVID, i stopped paying myself a salary there's no drawings and say so, hey it's an amazing feeling to work the last 14 months without getting paid and like to me that's like you know the epitome of um of just happiness to me is a state of being it's not really an emotion so the state i am in now is yeah just just happy it's a happy state yeah that's great now putting 2020 behind us and looking forward 2021 what sort of um is to come for your business and the brand are there any exciting products that you're working on that you can let us in on no oh, kim man there's so many things <laughs> i don't know where to get started so many things I, you know honestly like just there there's a load of things and i could sit here running on for another hour but um you know that uh, anyone listening just i'd be so grateful if you guys just jump on the ehp journey and you know support and watch everything that we're doing everything that we're rolling out there's a lot to come there's huge stuff to come i've mentioned a few of them beforehand um it's crazy innovation new limited edition flavors um yeah just some super cool things we're going to be doing our first global virtual um fitness expo you know we want to be one of the first to do that okay. and yeah we've got some some big numbers around around that um our technology play and actually developing ehp into into a fit tech enterprise with a rollout of we already have a lot of ip around um fitness technology and app, fitness applications so mm -hmm. it's taking that and housing that in the one ecosystem um called the ehp app and it will have everything in there um, every resource huge ecosystem supplements um you could even like find like you, you could be on there and you could get consultation from like you know somebody who's helping you train and you put on your headset and it's like if you were to close your eyes it's as though a pt is talking to you you've walked in the gym you press play and it's this virtual reality concept although you're not seeing stuff but it's um audio audio uh, vr almost where mm -hmm. you, walk, you walk into a gym and you're being coached through your entire session um and it's a feedback or loop where you can then actually say well that was hard or easy and it then modifies its approach through um okay. Yeah, through AI. So you, you, I was gonna say, you guys are going into into the AI side of things. So we've had tech app development stuff going for a long time. It's just stuff we're not known for. I just it's yeah. out there and it's a pretty big area of our company. Just we're not known for it, and that's fine. Um, it's like Tesla's not known for its huge batteries that it actually goes and puts into like buildings. It's it's actually solar batteries. Majority of revenue doesn't come from the cars. It's like huge amounts of revenue comes from the solar batteries. Um, same with us. There's actually a business within the business that drives a lot of things. And you talked about IP before. It's yeah, a huge area of investment that we really want to make to create the most comprehensive ecosystem for the entire EHP community to get everything they want. Sorry for sounding awesome. super vague, but yeah, when it drops. No, it drops. no, no. I mean, look, I, I think, you know, as you said, you know, for any of you guys out there, like if you're not already, you can, you know, just follow EHP Labs on, on Insta, on Facebook. Um, they can also follow you personally, is um, yeah. through your profile there um, to get a bit more, you know, raw insight into what you guys are doing.